Um, yeah, General uh, Hetherington mentioned this morning that the Korean problem is fixed. Uh, Dr. Ku and I had a little chat just before this panel. Um, we also have the same concern too that because um, uh, towards the end of this year, uh, during the midterm election, many of the Republican uh, tickets will uh, run for security issues. And if the Korean issue is gone, uh, they probably will be in the lost, right? Uh, I said, no, no worry, uh, because all eyes will be on China. And, and there's no lack of problem security issues with China, and only to be bigger. So uh, the Republican tickets should not be uh, worried at all. Um, when we come to talk about um, deterrence with, um, in, in Asia Pacific, and my focus uh, is on US-China side, and a lot of very, very um, difficult issues. So um, just as always, I'd like to um, put forward my uh, disclaimer. And what, what I uh, have to say in the following, it is um, really my uh, one person's perspective. Uh, and I am here to raise some issues and hopefully and generate some good questions and, and a dialogue. And so uh, what I'm going to say does not represent the US government, uh, the Army, uh, the World College, and the Strategic Studies Institute. Uh, with that clear, and um, I also want to say that um, through this conference, uh, a lot of these previous discussions have already touched upon the theoretical uh, aspect of it, um, so that I don't need to go uh, into the discussion of the theoretical. There are so many theoretical uh, aspects of it. And especially this morning, um, we have another piece, which is very good, talking about all these aspects of uh, deterrence. It's very good. Uh, thank you all for that. And as we move on, to talk about deterrence in Asia Pacific is mostly, especially on my part, is between the United States and China. So the question is then, uh, what kind of a deterrence? I think I'm not going to talk about the nuclear deterrence part. And between China and the United States, it is more of a uh, conventional deterrence and more of a conventional uh, issue in this area. So I'm going to skip the, um, the nuclear aspect of it. And I, know, I understand there's, there's a huge di discussion on that part as well. But uh, it's not in the scope of my presentation here. And then when we come to talk about US-China deterrence, uh, we also um, should see that um, in terms of threats on, on both sides, it's more uh, the Chinese fear of the United States attack on China. Although the United States have um, repeatedly reassured China that we have no intention to invade China, to attack China, to have a war with China, the Chinese really uh, still believe deeply the United States has the intent to do so. So in, in that sense then, if we are talking about deterrence between these two nations, big as they are, uh, it's mostly on the Chinese side. It's concern is of a me immediate attack. So, uh, but there is no uh, concern on, the, on, on this side of the Pacific of a Chinese attack on the United States homeland. So if we talk about immediate deterrence, it's more on Chinese side, and mostly it is a concern rather than a reality. And then furthermore then, um, the central focus here is more about extended deterrence. It is about a third party. And this third party is China's conflict with an, another Asia nation. And the United States come in to make commitment to their defense. So in essence, we are, when we talk about deterrence with China in conventional way, um, it is what we understand as the uh, extended deterrence. And then um, just briefly following this theoretical, dis uh, the theoretical discussion about deterrence, extended deterrence here, conventional part. And at this point, I think we can rule out the aspect of punishment. I don't think the United States today is talking about uh, launching a punitive attack or retaliation, taking it all the way into China, that kind of a punishment. 
and um, even talk about some concepts uh, at this point, um, still we have a lot of reservations on that. And so then that finally comes to this most talked about concept, deterrence by denial. How can we uh, raise the cost of any Chinese actions outside of, of its uh, boundary um, so that China will think twice or many times before it will undertake such, such an action. So that is what most of the discussion and policy discussion as well as academic discussion uh, are focused on and extended uh, deterrence by denial. Okay. So with that said, then I'm going to just turn to three cases. Um, there could be many issues to uh, exercise deterrence between China and the United States, especially uh, from the U.S. side. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, but just want to highlight three very specific cases. Um, so we're going to talk about exactly how we are going to do it, um, not in military operation sense, but in uh, practical implementation, that kind of a sense, all right? Um, so I'm going to just single out Taiwan um, and China-Japan dispute over uh, the islands in East, Asia, uh, East China Sea, and then finally, uh, South China Sea issue. Um, this will provide us three very good cases to see what, how um, does it stand at this point, deterrence between China and the United States, um, highlighted by these three cases. The first one is about Taiwan. The United States, in essence, has extended uh, this deterrence to Taiwan since 1950, when President Truman sent the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait. Initially, it was thought to be a temporary commitment, but then very quickly, as the Cold War and then the Korean War uh, somehow turned this into a long-term commitment. Uh, to the defense of Taiwan. And then a divided China has been in place for almost 70 years. Um, in 1979, when the United States and China uh, resumed dip diplomatic relations and uh, relocated the formal recognition of China from Taipei to Beijing, Congress had passed the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, once again, put US commitment to the defense of Taiwan in a very clear manner. So, for so long, almost 70 years, coming after the fact, uh, we can fair to say, we can feel safe to say that U.S. extended deterrence has worked for so long to prevent China from launching a military operation to force unification with Taiwan. Okay, so um, it's hard to prove in social sciences uh, of anything. But this particular case, just coming after the fact, we can um, really feel safe to say that has to be the case. The mainland China has not used force on Taiwan to force unification. Well, the situation is changing. Taiwan has now become a uh, full-fledged democracy. All voices get to be heard, and people get to choose their future. And it's a very divided, uh, nation. And then mainland China is also changing. And then more importantly, the United States is also changing, uh, upgrading its commitment uh, from time to time and also um, handling this issue, trying to hold the balance uh, in the Taiwan Strait from time to time. All these three factors are also changing. And then the most important one at this point, the most uh, dangerous variable, if you call it, is Chinese growing military power. So as the pictures show you, that China has really, in the last 20 years, through its military modernization, has built up a very formidable force around Taiwan. And as we're talking about it of late, uh, Chinese bombers, fighter jets, and um, warships are able to circle around Taiwan. 
And the A2, AD capability, in some sense, can keep US Navy and um, Air Force at bay for some distance. So that is a very, very uh, growing concern on the United States side. And so that is um, the picture with Taiwan. Now, the question then is, how, how much longer can the United States maintain this status quo and extend its deterrence on Taiwan? Uh, it really depending on uh, the growing Chinese uh, power. And the Chinese are convinced as well that um, until China has the credible military capability, it's not going to solve the Taiwan issue. So they are determined to go down that path to have the military power. So unfortunately, I want to just put forward this proposition that the final arbiter on this issue is a matter of national power between China and the United States. Very difficult to accept, but I'm willing to um, put it forward over here. The, the other issue then is China's dispute with uh, Japan over the Senkaku Diaoyu Island, just a little northeast of Taiwan. Well, um, China and Japan is now uh, taking measures against each other, both in maritime as well as in, in the air. The United States, back in 2014, President Obama um, made a very clear commitment, reiterated United States commitment to the defense of Taiwan if China were to use force to settle that territorial dispute. The president was not the first one to reaffirm this commitment, but he is the first US president to make it clear that way. So, that is very effective extended de deterrence on the Chinese side. But the problem is that China has never made clear what is the end game um, on this disputed island. Is it going to share with Japan? That sounds bizarre. Is it going to take it over? Um, at this point, it's not likely. So the Chinese are just muttering through, sending vessels to that island, and try to take over the control uh, of the island if they can. So as long as China operates under the so-called gray zone area, not crossing the threshold, it's not going to trigger the implementation of Article 5 of US-Japan Mutual Defense Treaty. So that is going to be a very agonizing process between China and the United States and involving Japan. Okay, So that will be the case for us to see uh, for a long time to come. So finally, come to the South China Sea. I think everybody here in the audience must have an opinion uh, as what South China Sea deterrence should be. Okay, um, it is a very messy situation in in the South China Sea, as the the map uh, indicates. There are many overlapping claims, and there are many effective controls as well of the land features. Now, I use the term land features. I don't want to use the term island because the term island is well defined in the law of the sea. And land features may or may not be an island. So we need to be very precise and accurate about that um, the term. So there are over, overlapping uh, claims on those land features in the South China Sea. Okay? The United States certainly look at this area with a lot of concern. To, it's an understatement, all right? So let's start with the question. When it comes to South China Sea between China and the United States, the question first come to our mind in this conference context is that what to deter? What are we to deter with respect to China? So we can talk about China's aggression and expression, uh, expansion. Those are very vague terms precisely what this aggression and expansion is need to be clarified here. Okay? Um, at this point, China have effective control of the northern part of those land features, the Paracels and Scarborough Shoal, and then the, um, the other one close to Taiwan. The most disputed one is in the southern part of what we know as the Spratly, um, sp Spratly land features. China, at this point, has six occupied and controlled properties there. Vietnam has, now, 
Among those dots there, that's about 50 of those that are permanently above water. And then what underneath is the result of volcano things, and then it's very dangerous area, a great yard of uh, navigation. Vietnam has uh, there are about 50 of those are, that are permanently above water, and they are for grabs. And Vietnam has effective control of between 21 to 29, depending on how they count those land features. Malay and Philippines each has about 10. China has six, the red dots in there. And you can also see that those dots are somehow mixed, intermingled in like a party. And they are not very well divided. In other words, there are Chinese occupation right next to a Vietnamese occupation and then next to the Philippine occupation. Now that presents a very challenging situation to what we refer to as deterrence. So if we are to deter China's aggression or expansion, we are talking about potential Chinese use of force to take more of those dots in the spreadlet. Now, those dots were effectively controlled by Vietnam, Philippines, and um, Malay. Does that mean the Chinese would have to use force to evict the Vietnamese people as, as, as well as a garrison military force as well? Uh, is that what we have in mind? It's not entirely clear, okay? So, um, with that in mind then, we have a few um, proposed measures for the United States to answer the question, how exactly are we going to deter China? So in recent years, there, had, uh, there have been a number of um, proposed uh, policy recommendations. The first one is to have our, those disputants, what we call partners or allies, to bear the primary responsibility in deter deterring China and in a deterrence by denial sense, the United States would help them to build up a defense so that China would not be so easy to use force against them. And the United States will also provide them with the military capability as well, assuming they can uh, spend money to build, build up this military capability and have the will to do so. And, and then the United States would then uh, supplement this uh, deterrence by denial with U.S. force. We don't know how exactly the U.S. force would come to the rescue of these nations if the push comes to uh, shelf, okay? That remains as a question. And then more provocatively is to have U.S. direct involvement in deterring China. There has been several very provocative publications of late, and I have highlighted three of them by their last name, okay? in deterring China. And broadly speaking, there could be four approaches. The first one is to block China's access to the South China Sea. We don't know how we can do that, but that at least comes into the mind during um, the former Secretary of State's Congress, uh, congressional uh, confirmation hearing. He said, if China was so aggressive, we might think about blocking China's access to the South China Sea land features. I don't know we, how we can do that, at least it's a thought. And then the other one is to roll back the Chinese um, holdings in the South China Sea. Um, does that mean a war with China? We don't know, we quite, don't quite know. How can we evict the Chinese from those constructed uh, features in the South China Sea and then uh, get them out of this, the, the dotted lines there? It's not clear either. And then have US troops in the South China Sea that some, it's not a joke because there is talk about negotiating with Taiwan for e to Abar so that the United States can actually put troops on the island because that island is the largest one in the Spratly Island. There is fresh water, there's vegetation, and it can sustain human life. So if we are to rent that property from Taiwan, we can actually put troops in Taiwan, then we will become a residence power in the South China Sea. That would be very interesting, okay? Um, China may, not, may or may not be able to do anything about it. And so that's another thought. And then finally, is this what uh, some people call it offset strategy is to put sanctions on China so that it will raise the cost so big, all right? So those are the options as uh, with respect to what to deter 
and how to deter. And I just want to highlight this and let our audience uh, see that. Uh, there is no good answer to it. And I want to conclude my uh, conclusion with a joke here um, that's relevant to the, uh, to the answer. Um, the joke is about uh, a professor of philosophy. And philosophy deals with what is real, what is not. Uh, what is reality and what is not. So at the end of the course, the professor told the students that the final exam will be an in-class essay. So the student come to the classroom and the professor comes in and then he said today's topic is this. He take the chair and put it on the desk and ask the student to write an essay to tell him that the chair doesn't exist. So all these students say, my Lord, how am I going to write this essay? So all are scratching their head. That's when one student just came up and turned in his answer with two words. He said, what chair? My Lord, that's the perfect answer. So he got an A out of it. And then the rest of them just sitting there with, uh, figuring what, what that answer is. What chair? So I leave this with you with respect to this is that when we talk about deterring China in the South China Sea, is that what deterrence and how? Thank you very much.